You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Now, it's been a long time since we've talked about ancient warfare on the show. It's been too long, in fact. I have been missing the legions. I've been missing the phalanxes. Or are they phalanx I? I was never that good at my ancient Greek. Actually, I don't think I ever studied ancient Greek. There wasn't much call for it in uh, Tassie. Uh, that's Tasmania to uh, all non-Australian listeners. But I did study a bit about the Roman legions, and I have been studying them a lot for another show that we will talk to our listeners about in about mm, three months. But until then, I've got a question. Just like if Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield had a fair fight, who would have won? Who would have won between the phalanxes and the legions if they came together? Well, luckily, listeners, they did fight, and someone did win. G'day, listeners, and welcome to the Dead Prussian Podcast. I am your host, the humblest host of the show, Mick, and I want to thank everyone for their support over the holiday break, especially for their support on Patreon and social media. We hit 80,000 downloads in 2018, and I think, I think that's a record for the show. Uh, I've got to go back to the other producers and check, but I'm pretty sure 2018 was a bumper year, given we had a massive pause due to some health concerns in the middle of it. So thanks very much for your support. Now, I talked at the start about phalanxes and legions. Why? Because recently I was lucky enough to score an awesome book and have a read about the legion versus phalanx. The Epic Struggle for Infantry Supremacy in the Ancient World. Now, if you've read the book, you know who my guest is. And I know at least one of my Patreon legends, Stu, has read this book. My guest today is, of course, Mike Cole. Now, Mike has been a security contractor, government civilian, and military officer. His career has run the gamut from counterterrorism to cyber warfare to federal law enforcement. Basically, don't get on his wrong side. He's done three tours in Iraq and was recalled to serve during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. He recently joined the cast of Hunted on CBS as part of an elite team of fugitive hunters. That's, that's a TV show. He's not actually hunting any of the actors on the show, uh, ladies and gents. He also writes very good science fiction and fantasy novels. Now, I know this because I've also read quite recently one of his, I'm going to say it's one of his best works because I've read two of his books, so I can say that. Uh, the Armoured Saint. It's a cracking read. It's nice and quick to read, so make sure you get it into your heads. But most importantly to us, he's a historian and an author on ancient warfare. He's recently written a book about ancient infantry tactics, and in particular, the showdown between the big daddies of the ancient world, the Legion and the Phalanx. Now, this book is appropriately titled Legion versus Phalanx, and was published by Osprey Publishing in 2018. Mike, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. Now, Mike, before we get started discussing your book and, and finding who won uh, you know, the greatest punch-up of the ancient world, or I, I suppose there was a few punch-ups uh, between them in the ancient world, but that's, that's how you do it. You've always got to have the rematch. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you got interested in researching ancient infantry tactics in the Mediterranean. Um, so it, it's funny, uh, my dad, I grew up, my dad took me to wargaming clubs, miniatures wargaming when I was a kid. And uh, as I got older, I fell away from that. I think not because it was too nerdy, but it, because it was too labor intensive. You know, miniatures wargaming takes all of this painting. Um, and I got back into hex and counter wargaming as an adult because uh, I think I could finally, I mean, you know, the kind of games I'm talking about, these really mm. crunchy war games from GMT where the rules are so complicated that you're playing for three hours and then you realize you've been playing wrong. You know, they, 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 they work overtime to make the games as accurate as possible and to, yeah. to leech all the fun. Uh, there should be no fun whatsoever in playing the game. It should be just as much <laughs> of a slog as, as actual warfare. Um, and I love them. I just love them. And um, GMT's Great Battles of History series, which probably a lot of your listeners are familiar with, um, has SPQR and phalanx, which are modules that focus specifically on the Hellenistic age, the third and second centuries BC after the death of Alexander the Great. Mm. So I was playing a lot of these legion versus phalanx fights. And um, 
you know, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of like a who would win in, the f- win in a fight question, you know, Batman or Superman, the X-Wing or the TIE fighter. You yeah. have these incredibly different, you know, these incredibly different formations with different equipment and different um, deployment and different leadership styles. And they're outgrowths of two very different cultures. So it's this really cool nerd question. So I was like, all right, well, you know, I want to go read about that. And I was shocked to find that there isn't anything written in English. Um, there are <laughs> articles about it in academic journals. There are, you know, blog posts and, and you know, amateur web meanderings on it, but nobody had written a, in English, uh, a professional deep diving book on that topic. And I thought, well, you know, I'll write it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like anything else. You, you get excited about something. It's the typical dilettante dilemma. Yeah. And then you start chasing it down and you realize you've bitten off way more than you can <laughs> chew. Right. So I'm, I'm here. I am teaching myself teeny Greek and Latin, um, which is easier than I thought it would be. Uh, if, you, if you already know some romance languages, English and French in my case. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and, and putting the thing together. And then, once I was about, I think, you know, halfway through, I approached my agent, who is, you know, Joshua Billmas. He's, he's a science fiction and fantasy specialist. He, he does nonfiction, but, you know, he's certainly never done nonfiction for me. And uh, I said to him, hey, you know, I, I, I want to sell this. And he was like, I, I don't know, man. You don't have a PhD. You're not a professor. I can't imagine any nonfiction press, you know, serious nonfiction press is going to buy this from you, even if it's good. And um, I'm, I'm assuming you're like me. Yeah, go ahead. Tell me what I can't do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, as soon as you said that, I was like, well, now, now I got to do it. Um, so we went out to market with it and, you know, look, Joshua knows his business. He hasn't been one of the leading agents in the industry for 30 years for no reason. Um, yeah. He was right. And, and the, all of the big publishers uh, came back and rejected me. Um, but Osprey, uh, this is the, military history imprint of bloomsbury highly illustrated um they do a lot of work and they take as credit um from their authors the prior military experience carries a lot of weight with them and a lot yeah. of their authors are are military historians in that sense um yeah. and so they took me a little more seriously and then in the middle of it though i had one advantage which is as you said i start on hunting and when you look uh i think anybody else who start on a primetime TV show, we had something like 12 million viewers on our premiere episode, would have used that same for something maybe a little more lucrative, but no, <laughs> it's Mike Cole. So I used it to kick down the door and get myself a, a history book deal. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really glad I did. I'm really glad I did. But writing, you know, learning about this and, and sort of, look, I've wanted to be in a story in my whole life and, uh, and being able to finally convert that dream into something real is, it's just incredible for me. And uh, and now that we're into the book, oh, before we, we get into the book, um, I'll just confirm that uh, despite the way the trajectory of the Star Wars actual films, um, there are far more X-Wings killed by TIE fighters than TIE fighters killed by X-Wings. So I think we have to say the TIE fighter. And uh, everyone knows Batman would beat Superman in a fight. Because, um, <laughs> Superman is the, is the stereotypical meathead, in my opinion. All right, now, before we get too divisive <laughs> on the show, let's, let's move on to your book. Now, Legion versus Phalanx. Um, this was actually the first book of yours I read. And uh, mainly because it sounded awesome, but also because you were kind enough to send me a copy after I begged you for one. Um, and I'm a, I'm a fan of ancient history and uh, our listeners, I've been taunting some of our listeners and our Patreon subscribers with uh, an ancient history flavor show um, that's coming up as an imprint of uh, TDP Studio. So we'll see what happens. Um, but I was familiar with most of the battles you discuss in the book. Um, however, I was not as aware, as aware as I thought I actually was of the detail of the tactics um, of the Legion and the Phalanx. Can you give me the listeners like a very short synopsis of what you cover in the actual book? Sure. Um, so uh, first of all, I want to say that I chose the six battles. Obviously the six battles I cover in Legion versus Phalanx are not the only six battles in which the Legion faced the Phalanx. Um, but I picked those for uh, one reason, and that is that those six battles, the problem when you look at the ancient world is a paucity of primary source material. You're always 
you know, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, for a book proposal that I actually have out now going to market, I had to uh, look into the battle of Pylos and Spactory in 425 BC. Yeah. There is one source for that battle, period. Thucydides, that's it. Um, uh, you know, you, you're, so it makes it really, really difficult for you to fact check and, you know, uh, in, in any detail, right? Um, yeah. These six battles that I picked, for, for Legion versus Phalanx, I picked them because there were multiple primary sources writing on each one. So you had, at a minimum, Polybius and Livy, but in other cases, you had Diodorus Siculus, or you had Cassius Dio, or you had Alien. Um, you, you, you had other sources chiming in. And what's important about that is it gives you the opportunity. Look, when I write about Pilots and Factoria, basically, I'm just telling you what Thucydides said, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and the only area where I really have, you know, I can add my analysis to it. I have my translation of the Greek versus the Loeb edition translation of the Greek, but it's Thucydides. And if Thucydides is, so I'm basically a slave to Thucydides' agenda. Whereas when I'm writing about, you know, um, Beneventum or Asculum or Magnesia, you know, I can check like a good detective uh, different sources against each other and come to a much clearer picture of the truth. Which yeah. is why I really, really enjoy doing it. You know, my entire career, I've been in intelligence and law enforcement. Um, on Hunted, I was a hunter. You know, I, detective work is what I do. Yeah. So, in a way, writing the book was almost familiar, a familiar, familiar thing. Anyway, this is all background and not actually the question you asked. So let me answer that. <laughs> um, so uh, we have on one side the Hellenistic phalanx. This is not the Hoplite phalanx. Notice that I say hoplite and not hoplite. Hoplite mm -hmm. being the anglicization, hoplite being the, the way it was pronounced in Greek. Um, the hoplite phalanx of classical Greece, the guys that your reader or your uh, listeners are probably familiar with from 300. Yeah. No, no, no. The Hellenistic phalanx was uh, staffed by the pezhetairoi, the foot companions of the king. Instead of carrying the eight foot spear of the hoplite, they carried a 16 to 21 foot pike held in two hands. And instead of having that uh, big, big round aspis shield that the Hoplite carried, they have the small pelta, about the size of a manhole cover. And their left hand protrudes from behind that shield, which is slung around their neck, to hold that pike with both hands. Um, and then, of course, they wear all the, you know, the armor that you would be familiar with, with a, from a Hoplite. And unlike the Hoplite phalanx, they deploy usually in 16 ranks with the first five points. Of the, of the first five pikes um, projecting past the guy in front. So what is effectively created here is this massive hedgerow of pikes. Um, literally for every uh, phalangite in the front rank, you have five pike heads projecting past him. Um, and the pikemen we know from Polybius deployed at three foot intervals. So literally it's nearly impenetrable. And keep in mind that every, remember, 16 ranks, only the first five are leveled. The rest are inclined to varying degrees from 45 to straight up. And when you're talking about 16,000 people, which is uh, as many, uh, roughly as many phalangites as were present at Kinokephale under Philip V, the Antigonid army in 197 BC, that provides a, a, a canopy over these, these warriors that protects them from missile fire. Um, yeah. So it really is an amazing defensive formation. What's its weakness? Well, you can guess. Hit it from the flank, hit it from the rear, it's vulnerable. It can't right, even right or left base, right? Because you have 21-foot pipes. It's yeah. extremely difficult for it to maneuver. This is a formation that is designed to be deployed on flat ground, unbroken ground, to march straight ahead, if at all. And as we know from Alexander the Great, it was primarily used to pin enemy formations in place while some other more mobile arm of the army, in Alexander's case, his Ahemma cavalry, would deliver the knockout blow. Yeah. Now, we go over to the Legion, and it couldn't be more different. Although I do want to point out that both the Hellenistic phalanx and the Legion, the Roman Legion, and mind you, I'm talking here about the Polybian Legion. We call it the Polybian Legion because we have the description from Polybius. But this is the, the Legion prior to the reforms of Gaius Marius in 109 BC that would have been the Legion that took the Roman Republic, the pre-imperial Rome to glory. Both yeah. the Polybian Legion and the Hellenistic phalanx both evolved from Hoplite 
phalanxes. A lot of people don't know that the Romans during the regal period did fight as poplites, just as the Greeks did. Yep. Um, so it's, it's interesting that these are two branches of the same military tradition. Why did the Romans evolve differently? Well, there's lots of debate about that. I personally think it had to do with that phalanx's defeat by um, Brennus and the Senones, which were a, a Gallic tribe that, um, as you know, beat them at the Battle of the Alia and went on to sack Rome. Yep. So they evolved uh, into much, much smaller, um, more dispersed units uh, known as maniples from the Latin manipulus for a handful. Uh, we all know that this was the, there were three lines, the triplex aces, the first line being the hastati, um, which is Latin for spearmen, which is, they didn't have spears. So uh, you can tell that's a piece of evidence that they fought as a phalanx, right? Because they're yeah. still called spearmen. And these, of course, were the youngest, um, you know, men in the prime of their lives, uh, you know, uh, usually wearing a bronze pectoral, a single greave. Uh, it's, that's disputed. Some people think too. The famous Roman scutum, this oblong shield that was long. And instead of being slung on the arm, the way the um, phalanx is pelte, the small phalanx shield was, this was held in the center, uh, a horizontal handle inside a bronze boss, the umbo in Latin. This is important because it made this 22 pound shield into a boxing glove. Their primary weapon, as you know, was the gladius espaniensis, which most of your listeners probably call the gladius, which was the almost like a long knife, a two foot sword, which could be both used to cut and thrust, but Polybius tells us the Romans preferred to thrust as it was more lethal. And we know that the Romans carried two pila, the javelins, one thick, one thin, which would throw from a distance, equipped with a long shank to make it bend so it couldn't be reused. The goal here is to either obviously kill or wound the enemy, but also to transfix the shields and make them ungainly and heavy and cause their opponents to discard them. The second line, the principes, uh, the leaders, um, were older men, a little more experienced, a little bit better gear, but otherwise armed the same as the Astati. And the third line, the triarii, um, which means the guys in the third row, literally. Um, smaller maniples, and these are your grizzled, hardened veterans, and they're equipped as the first two lines, except that instead of the um, uh, the pila, they have a long thrusting spear like they did from their old hoplite days. And uh, the Romans have this wonderful expression, which I have tattooed on my chest um, from Livy, uh, because remember, if, if the enemy reached the triarii, they necessarily have defeated the first two lines. So the Romans yep. have this expression, ad triarius radice, which means it comes down now to the triarii, basically meaning this is it. Yeah. Um, from Livy. And of course, there are skirmisher corps to both armies and cavalry corps and artillery and elephants, but uh, I won't talk about those, and I specifically don't talk about them in the book, because the book really is concerned strictly with the heavy infantry and how they fought one another. Um, uh, hopefully, hopefully that was not too long-winded. No, that was great, mate. That was great. So what, what I really like about the, the two, uh, the way you've described the two uh, different infantry formations uh, and also in the book is the diagrams as well. You, you, you have some great diagrams in there, particularly uh, the maniple system uh, of the legion uh, that shows you um, the different different uh, ways that it, it fought, including you know the the triary bit as you just um, mentioned. Now, listeners, Mike uh, speaks uh, all the lingo perfectly. I'm going to anglicise the hell out of everything. Um, even to the point where I might even call him Thucky Dides. Uh, that's not true. I'll call him Thucydides. Um, not that I actually have any questions <laughs> about him. The only time I was going to mention him was to mention that uh, that joke um, today. Now, um, I, my computer's trying to do a Java install, so we won't do that right now during the show. What we will do is maybe talk about um, one of the battles because you, you, you talk about how... Uh, the phalanx works. You talk about how the, the legion uh, works. Um, and, you know, there seemed to be, regardless of which formation it was, there, there, there was a lot of cooperation that was required between the two. But as you, you mentioned in the book, um, you know, perhaps the, um, the legions had a little bit more uh, freedom at the individual uh, commander levels. So that must have made a difference in the battle. So let, let's talk about the, the six main battles. Well, well, we won't talk about all six battles because my listeners will need to get off the treadmill or get out of their car at some point. But which of the six battles that you covered do you believe is the best well, example of these two formations clashing in their traditional forms? It, it would have to be Pydna. Uh, this is, that's the last one uh, fought in 167 BC. 
Yeah. Uh, and I actually, this is another good one for me to talk about because um, I was super, super lucky. Um, and this is, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a little bit of a digression. When I first wrote this book, um, I, I was sort of keenly aware that I'm not a professional, right? I was keenly aware that I'm an, I'm an enthusiastic amateur um, and that, uh, um, uh, you know, I had to uh, maybe seek out guidance and counsel. And uh, I was very, very lucky, um, excuse me, uh, 168 BC, not 167. Um, and uh, I met Mike Livingston, who was also a fantasy author. He has three great books out with Tor. Um, and he uh, invited me down. He's a professor of medieval warfare at the Citadel, which is one of our big military schools here at, in the United States. Yeah. And he invited me down there to, to lecture on um, cyber warfare. I, I also do, um, I have a background in, in cyber warfare and currently do uh, criminal investigation for a bank in that regard. Um, at the time, I was with the NYPD um, doing uh, computer crime stuff. So uh, I went down to visit him and we talked about the book and we talked about my, my research methods and sort of, you know, he kind of took it all in. And then we went out to dinner, me, him, and Kelly DeVries. Kelly DeVries is a pretty um, big wig, uh, medieval warfare historian, consulted to Game of Thrones, uh, and one of, the, one of the best Latinists out there. And, uh, and Mike was like, so Mike, you know, are you planning to go to Greece and Italy and see the sites of these battles? And I was like, yeah, you know, no, not really. That's really expensive. I don't think I have a vacation time. You know, I don't need that. I've, I've got Google Earth. I've, you know, I've got maps you know i've got you know i'll be all right and mike turns to kelly and goes uh well, kelly what do you think of that and kelly goes well i think that's really stupid <laughs> <laughs> and the both of them looked at me and they were like mike you know you a battle is its ground which is what mike's sort of um mantra is he was like you cannot understand what happened unless you go stand there man yeah so i did um, I did. Uh, and God bless both of them. They spent thousands of dollars of their own money and took their own time and went with me to both of the medievalists. They didn't get anything out of this other than the pride of mentoring me and the fun vacation. You know, we got drunk every night. It was a blast. Um, but it was just <laughs> such a wonderful, wonderful experience. And then, you know, they, they kind of supervised and sort of used Socratic method and, um, you know, walked me through it. And, I, and, it, and so I actually stood where Pibna was fought. And, yeah. uh, um, you know, the old city where Perseus of, of Macedon anchored his note that I'm saying Macedon, not Macedon. Um, Macedon is a legit way to say it. Uh, that's the anglicization. But in the Greek, it's a kappa, which is a hard K sound. Yeah. So Perseus of Macedon anchored uh, his, the left of his line on this city. And I went and saw it. But the reason that I think that Pydna is the best example of a legion versus phalanx battle from my book is that in all other five battles, there are mitigating circumstances. The, the formations are clashing in less than ideal circumstances. For example, in the Battle of Kenokephale, the two armies blundered into each other, didn't have a chance to set up correctly. It, it was also, uh, they were obscured in fog. In um, the Battle of Beneventum, there was a botched surprise attack, a botched maneuver and, that occurred in the dark, and there was a fortification involved. The Battle of Pydna is as close to a straight set piece battle, as we call it, um, between the Legion and the Phalanx. It's 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 the best example. That's that's awesome. Um, and I that's a that's the last that's the last one in the book. I'm pretty sure you covered. I'll, I'll just check the book here. Um, because yes, it that, is. It is the last. It's the last one in the book. Yeah. So that was. Um, so for the readers, as you're getting into it, and uh, you know, some of my listeners may have called me the not not necessarily the most modest bloke around when it comes to claiming knowledge of things. But by the time you get to the Battle of Pydna, I think uh, in the book, uh, ladies and gents, you kind of understand how they're supposed to work, and and you kind of start getting frustrated with the other five battles that hey, just just fight properly um, because <laughs> you know, it never happens that way in war, of course, but you, you kind of yeah. just, you know, this, this, the whole premise for this book is just to see who's, whose dad can win and fight. Right. Um, That's right. But the, thing, the thing you have to remember, the thing you have to remember, Mick, is that even though the battle of Pydna is the closest to the two formations fighting under ideal circumstances in the way the battle started, which is that a mule got away. Right. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I love this. Let me just tell it really quick because yep. I, just so people understand what I'm talking about. Look, Pydna was a set piece battle. 
the two formations did line up the way they're supposed to and fight properly, as you're saying, over mostly flat terrain. Uh, in, toward the end of the battle, uh, Paulus drew the Antigonid phalanx up into the broken ground in the foothills of Mount Olacross, which turned out to be his saving grace and the, and the winning move. But um, uh, initially, the two armies had set up uh, across from each other, and uh, neither one was confident in their ability to win. And uh, in fact, Paulus's men, because the Romans had been defeated at the Battle of Callinicus just previously, uh, were chomping at the bit to fight and trying to pressure him to fight. And there's a great quote, I believe, from Plutarch, which has Paulus saying, look, man, uh, I'm not so stupid to take on a formed up phalanx on good ground. So you need to chill. Um, of course, he doesn't say it quite like that, but uh, <laughs> that is basically what he said. Well, anyway, um, there's a Roman watering party. Uh, actually, probably not Roman, probably allied Italian infantry. Uh, and because, man, it's June on the Thermaic Gulf. Uh, and I was there in, in the summer. It gets hot. It's so hot. And so they're hot. They're, they're going to get water. And uh, I don't know if you have any experience working with livestock, but uh, horses, cows, even today, you know, when they get the scent of water and they're really, really thirsty, uh, there's not a lot you can do to control them. So one of these mules, whose job it was, was to carry water back to the thirsty troops, takes off running because it smelled water at, at the river. Um, and the Romans are chasing after it. And they come around a, a corner, they come around some bushes, and there's the river and the mules in the water. And there are a bunch of Thracians. Um, these were, uh, you know, a Balkan people, uh, northeastern uh, Greece now. Uh, that uh, were serving as light troops for the Antigonids, for Perseus and Macedon, and they got the mule. And <laughs> now look, I mean, a mule is, it's not a cheap piece of equipment or a cheap animal, pack animal, but it's also not expensive enough to risk a general engagement when your general has told you that that's not what's to happen. But yeah. it was hot, the Romans were pissed, they were angry, they wanted to fight. And here were a bunch of guys with their damn mule, and they were not going to let that stand. So what you then have is this gang fight of these probably not even equipped Thracians for the Antigonids and allied Italians. I can't remember the tribes that they were from off the top of my head. Um, you know, probably Southern Italy, like from, from Campania to Apulia, um, just slugging it out, beating the snot out of each other in this river trying to get the mule. Um, and Perseus, the Romans were deployed in the foothills where the ground was more broken. And Perseus was deployed on the plain below and really wanting to draw the Romans onto flat ground where the phalanx would have the advantage. Yeah. And Perseus of Macedon sees this brawl over this mule and thinks, all right, well, great. This is the opportunity I've been waiting for and marches his whole army out to fight forcing Paulus's hand. So while this was a set piece battle, while this was ultimately ideal, um, you know, the way it started, it's one of those things that it's so crazy that if it happened, if I put it in a, in a fantasy novel, my editor would be like, this is too unrealistic. You can't do this. <laughs> yeah, <that's>, <laughs> <laughs> give us some reality and bring back the demons. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, Mark, uh, I've loved chatting with you uh, today about uh, Legion versus Phalanx. Um, because, well, I'm just really into uh, ancient warfare, but uh, we've got uh, the final question we've got to ask, and it's, uh, it's the question every guest on the show gets, and it's about our mission, which is to define war in as many ways as possible, like Big Carl uh, von Clausewitz, the dead Prussian himself, and continue society's discussion about war. So I ask each guest to finish the sentence, war is. So right now, I ask you to finish the sentence, war is unnecessary oh that's done excellent that's uh that's a really really good answer and i'm kind of amazed after 70 plus episodes we haven't had someone just give us such a simple um answer so ladies and gents uh i'll, I'll, I'll say i say, this, I, say this in the, <laughs> I say this in the introduction to the book um i don't want anyone reading this book i have spent my entire life in the profession of arms, be it in intelligence, be it in 
as a warfighter, be it as a law enforcement officer. Um, I study warfare uh, out of a sense of posterity and interest in the human condition and out of a, and out of a sense of connection. This is my story. Um, but don't mistake that as in any way liking it. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I think it is a universal evil. And um, I think that most of the people who are fans of it are, are policy wonks that uh, have never been in a fight in their life. Uh, and I, uh, I really, I really, I really want to make sure that your listeners and readers of my book understand that uh, in no way does my study of war uh, seek to perpetuate or glorify it. It is a universal evil, and it is absolutely unnecessary. We don't need it. And uh, Mike, that is an excellent answer uh, to the final question, and it actually runs counter to some of the uh, answers we have received on the show, which is good because, uh, interestingly enough, it might be uh, good to go back and review who and who has not had a first-hand experience of war versus their answers. I don't have time to do that, but one of my listeners can do that and let me know the results. Mike, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks very much for writing your book and uh, talking about uh, who would win in the biggest uh, infantry punch-on there has ever been. Well, thanks so much for having me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can support Mike by following him on Twitter, because uh, that's where we have most of the show conversations, at Mike Cole. Now, it is M-Y-K-E-C-O-L-E. You can find links to his website there. You can also uh, check out his books. He's got a science fiction fantasy series, um, the Armoured Saint uh, series, with the Armoured Saint and the Queen of Crows are the two books in that series. Uh, on They're published by Tor. And you can also check out uh, Legion versus Phalanx. The easiest way to do this, listeners, check our show notes. I'll put the links to Mike's uh, books in there and his Twitter as well. But until next time, listeners, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website, www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons attribution licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.